In the long history of the land of Israel, there was never such a thing as a Palestinian people until the 20th century. Millions of pilgrims have come to the land of Israel over the last 3,000 years. They've come across Jews, Arab, Christians, Muslims, Druze, Turks. They've never met a Palestinian. There isn't a single book or piece of archaeological evidence that point to a Palestinian people. Here is an interesting anecdote. Two other great American novelists, Mark Twain and Herman Melville, visited the land of Israel, and like hundreds of other pilgrims, they wrote about how neglected the land was, and many wrote about how violent the local Arabs were. What's special about the Jews is that they never stole or used violence to take any land in the land of Israel. I'm always getting comments from Muslims and pro-Palestinians about Jews stealing the land from the local Arabs. Here is a challenge for you. Give me the name of one village that the Jews stole from the Arabs from the 7th century when the Arab Caliphate colonized the land of Israel until 1947 when the Arabs started a war to wipe out the Jews. And yes, during the War of Independence, many Arab villages were destroyed and about 700,000 people were displaced. That's what happens when you try to wipe out your neighbors you might well lose and have to pay the price. Ethnic cleansing is a very powerful expression. If in 1948 there were around 700,000 Palestinians and today there are 7 million in the land of Israel, you can't really use this term. It is Muslim countries who perpetrated ethnic cleansing on the Jews. You don't like what I'm saying? Then prove me wrong. What you are about to watch is a detailed and critical presentation in response to a video that has amassed approximately 3.7 million views and 50,000 comments in just over eight days since it was originally published on YouTube under the title of Free Palestine, No Thanks, The Israeli Perspective. A small trigger warning, I like facts. If you don't like what I'm saying, then bring me facts that contradict what I'm saying. If I say that Jerusalem is not mentioned in the Quran or that the Jews said yes to the partition plan in 1947 and the Arabs said no, or that there was no such thing as the Palestinians in the 18th century, then feel free to prove me wrong. Send me a link to a letter from a pilgrim to the land of Israel who says that he met a nice Palestinian. I'm asking you to challenge me. Oren, I accept your challenge and will be combing through your video to dismiss and dispel the misinformation and deception contained in your presentation, which I have reason to believe is a prime example of the gross falsification of Palestinian and Jewish histories. However, I would also like to emphasize that the reason why I'm publishing this video is to serve as an academic base and a historical resource for those seeking to counter your narrative, which is biased and inaccurate and clearly crafted with one objective in mind, that is to efface and diminish the legitimacy of the Palestinian people's history and their heritage in their ancestral land. Conversely, I would like to emphasize also that this video is by no means intended to insult, abuse or denigrate Jewish people, their culture or their history, nor is it a personal attack on the author of the original video with whom I have had no personal interactions or dealings with before. This is purely an academic and historically based response to an open challenge. Timestamps will be provided in the comments and description box below. There isn't a single book or piece of archaeological evidence that point to a Palestinian people, as it was the Roman Empire that gave the name Palestine to the area and the British Empire that gave it its borders. When the British and the French drew lines on maps, they invented two nations that never existed before, the Palestinians and the Jordanians. The Sykes-Picot Agreement was drawn together by Mark Sykes and François-Georges Picot, the British and French officers who masterminded the division and theft of the Middle Eastern realms following the fall of the Ottoman Empire. This agreement did not result in the emergence of only two modern nations, but of three, namely British Mandate Palestine, the Royal Hashemite Kingdom of Jordan, and the Zionist State of Israel, which was established in 1948. Archaeological surveys, samples and studies furnish the modern reader with a vast array of evidences, each confirming the historicity of a region referred to as Palestine, across a vast and diverse pool of primary sources, 
beginning from as early as the first millennia prior to the birth of Christ, in what archaeologists have presented as evidence of Egyptian hieroglyphs bearing the distinct and direct reference to the neighboring region today known as Palestine. These ancient inscriptions make reference to the region of Peleset and have been repeatedly mentioned in no fewer than five surviving inscriptions that are accessible to modern scholars. Furthermore, archaeological findings have corroborated and confirmed the existence of an ancient Palestine by discovering the Nimrud slabs left behind by the ancient Assyrian civilization, which date back to up to 800 years before the birth of Christ, also make mention to the same region as Palestu, and in some readings, Pelistu. Furthermore, the Greek sources are replete with references to Palestine, with the earliest known Greek reference to this region coming from Herodotus in his oft-celebrated histories, in which he explicitly and directly makes reference to the region as Palestine. Herodotus wrote his histories five centuries before the birth of Christ, whereas the Roman Palestine, also known as Syria Palestina, came into existence 200 years following the birth of Christ. In short, there are many ancient artifacts and documents wherein Palestine is mentioned. The truth is that the existence of Palestine predates the biblical and the Roman narrative. In the long history of the land of Israel, there was never such a thing as a Palestinian people until the 20th century. Millions of pilgrims have come to the land of Israel over the last 3,000 years. They've come across Jews, Arab, Christians, Muslims, Druze, Turks. They've never met a Palestinian. Pilgrims to the Holy Land prior to the 20th century would have attested to the presence of Jews, Christians, Muslims and Druze, but not to Palestinians for the two following reasons. Number one, the term Palestinian as we understand it today is anachronistic and does not fit within the historical context outlined in the video. Number two, prior to the Second World War and the subsequent defeat of the mighty Ottoman Empire, the Holy Land was ruled by the Ottomans for a period of 400 years, commencing in the year 1516 when Sultan Selim entered Jerusalem, having defeated the Mamluk Empire in the Battle of Marj Dabek, which took place on August 24, 1516. The Ottomans administered their vast realms and territories through a system known as the Millet system. This was a system in which all subjects of the Ottoman Empire, Muslim and otherwise, were to be recognized as citizens of the state by means of their religious affiliations and community. Thus, under the Ottoman Millet system, an Arab Christian, an Armenian Christian, a Greek Christian and a Coptic Christian were all collectively identified and ascribed to the Christian community. Likewise, no distinction was made at an administrative level between an Arab Muslim and his Kurdish or Persian co-religionists, as all of these were grouped under the collective label of Muslims belonging to the Muslim community. Citizens under the Ottoman Millet system were not accustomed to identifying themselves on ethnic or nationalistic grounds. They were simply Muslims, Christians, Jews, and members of the Druze community. This explains why there are no accounts of Palestinians existing in Palestine prior to the 20th century, just as there was no account of Israelis, Armenians, or Kurds residing in the same region. Nationalism was born of the French Revolution, which began in 1787, bringing along with it a set of radical and revolutionary concepts, including secularism and nationalism. Both of these ideologies will gradually infiltrate the Ottoman realms and its ranks, inspiring a new generation of Ottoman officers and citizens, who began to aspire towards having a distinct national identity which was detached from their religious belief. As a direct result of this new concept infiltrating the Ottoman realms, the Ottomans were challenged in a series of nationalistic uprisings from various regions as their Greek, Arab, Armenian, Kurdish and other ethnic groups began to demand sovereignty and independence on the ground of the newly found nationalistic pride and identity, resulting in many revolts and resistance struggles that culminated in the establishment and recognition of independent states across the Ottoman realms. Therefore, it was not until the early to mid 20th century that former subjects of the Ottoman administration relinquished the religious identifiers which were bestowed upon them under the millet system. 
in favor of their new distinct and secular identities based on nationalism and patriotism. Henceforth, the Christian, the Muslim, and the Jewish Arabs were considered part of the same nation, sharing a common identity above and beyond religious convictions in nations such as Lebanon, Egypt, Syria, and Palestine. These were a testament to the change in policy following the Ottoman Empire's decline. Likewise, the Christian millet was segmented into different nations belonging to the Greeks, the Armenians, and other Christian groups. The Kurds followed suit, as did the Jews and other groups who had been united previously under the banner of faith within the millet system. 700 years after the destruction of the temple, the Muslim colonized the land of Israel and said that Muhammad ascended to heaven from the place where the Jewish temples stood. Now, at this point, you may well be saying, what? The Muslims believe that Muhammad ascended to heaven from the exact same spot that is the holy site for the Jews, and this is not written in the Quran? Yes. Muslim historians and scholars have always been forthcoming with the fact that Prophet Muhammad وسلم, had been commanded to pray towards Jerusalem for over a year following his arrival in Medina and the encounter of the Jewish community there. Neither he nor his early followers turned their back towards Jerusalem, nor were they ignorant about its significance. It was only after the first year in Medina that the Muslim community were permitted to pray towards the Kaaba in Mecca, which was built by Abraham and his son Ismail. This command did not dismiss nor diminish the significance and importance of Jerusalem within the Muslim community. Jerusalem is described as the blessed land in chapter 17 verse 1 of the Holy Quran. It is also described in chapter 21 verse 71 as the blessed land to which Allah settled the prophet Lut and his family following the destruction of the city of Sodom and Gomorrah. As a matter of fact, and not opinion, the mosque in Jerusalem is described by the Prophet Muhammad وسلم, as the second house of worship established on earth following the Kaaba in Mecca. Furthermore, the city of Jerusalem is the third holiest city in Islam after Mecca and Medina. Not only did the Prophet Muhammad وسلم, inform his followers of the virtue and sanctity of Jerusalem, but he also encouraged them to pursue the opportunity to travel there and pray there. I will go even further and say that Jerusalem was never the capital of a Muslim empire. It was always Cairo, Damascus or Baghdad. While the statement is both factual and historically correct, the line of thinking and the context in which he seeks to frame the argument leads to the wrong conclusions. Indeed, Jerusalem was never the seat of dynastic rule at any point during the history of Islam. However, this does not mean that the city was not considered sacred or important to the Muslims. Mecca, for example, is the holiest city in Islam, yet it was never the seat of dynastic Muslim rule, even if we include the nine years of Abdullah ibn Zubayr's rule, which resulted in failure and the dissolution of his establishment. The historical truth is that Jerusalem has always been a center of attention and priority for all of the Muslim empires and dynasties, beginning from the early reign of Umar ibn al-Khattab who entered Jerusalem peacefully and refused to desecrate and destroy any of the churches and synagogues. In fact, both the Umayyads and the Abbasids invested inordinate amounts of wealth towards developing, adorning and fortifying the city of Jerusalem. Their architectural ambitions and accomplishments speak for themselves. The roof of the mosque in Jerusalem was literally covered in gold, something that was neither replicated in the Prophet's own mosque in Medina, nor in the sacred mosque in Mecca. Furthermore, the Muslim armies have long served as capable and committed guardians of the city, whereas there are no historical records of any Jewish army having risen to the rescue of the city against the invading crusaders who desecrated his sanctity time and time again. Yet for all the boastful claims of having more love towards Jerusalem and more right to the land, the Zionist mouthpieces have never been able to cite a single reference to any Jewish equivalent to the Muslim army or general such as Sultan Salahuddin al-Ayyubi and his men who came to the glorious defense of Jerusalem 
and restored peace and tranquility for all inhabitants, including the Jewish community. The Arabs used violence against Jewish civilians in the land of Israel many years before the occupation and many years before the land of Israel was established. And by the way, they didn't only use violence against the Jews. Christians suffered as well. Remember the German and American settlements I told you about? They suffered as well. The family of John Steinbeck, the American novelist, had a farm outside Jaffa, or at least they had it until Arabs broke in and murdered Steinbeck's great uncle and sexually assaulted his wife and his daughter. Here is an interesting anecdote. Two other great American novelists, Mark Twain and Herman Melville, visited the land of Israel, and like hundreds of other pilgrims, they wrote about how neglected the land was, and many wrote about how violent the local Arabs were. These are asinine and reckless statements, designed only to dehumanize and discredit the Arab struggle in Palestine. Anecdotal evidence and encounters from Europeans and Americans such as Mark Twain and Herman Melvin cannot and must not be used as a barometer by which we are to measure the humanity of an entire people. If we were to follow your example by citing European and American novelists and their opinions about Jewish people in their communities, this presentation would last several hours. And we will leave it at that. As for the second statement concerning evidence for land theft and crimes committed by Jewish settlers before 1948, in the very same year 1948, barely a year since the Zionists established themselves in the Holy Land, the League of Arab States had already gathered sufficient evidence, including a long list of transgressions and crimes committed by Jewish settlers, with which they were able to compile a lengthy document entitled Jewish Atrocities in the Holy Land. This was presented before the United Nations organization itself. The graphic nature of these atrocities, recorded and reported in this document, provide more than one account of theft and aggression towards the Arabs, accompanied by candid details of the brutal violations of Arab women and children who were targeted by Jewish mobs who subjected them to physical harm and other acts of barbarity. Had this platform permitted me to read and share the graphic contents of this document, I would have done so. Suffice it to say that this document leaves little to the imagination, and that there are certainly more than one account of theft and violence carried out by the Zionist settlers prior to 1948. The instances that you have cited on behalf of the Arabs were reciprocal and retaliatory for the most part. Did you know that the UN has two agencies for refugees? One for hundreds of millions of refugees all over the world, and another one called UNRWA, which is only for the most privileged refugees on earth, the Palestinians? Don't just take my word for it. Check it out for yourself. Did you know that according to a paper published on March 1st by the Congressional Research Service entitled US Foreign Aid to Israel, no other nation on earth receives as much financial support and aid as does Israel from the United States. Quote, Israel is the largest cumulative recipient of US foreign assistance since World War II. End quote. Until February 2022, the United States had provided Israel $150 billion in bilateral assistance. So while you complain about the hundreds of millions being spent towards Palestinians and other disadvantaged groups around the world, the US admittedly spends $150 billion towards Israel alone. In 1947, the UN proposed the division of the land into a Jewish state and an Arab state. The Jews said yes, and the Arabs said no, and then started a war in a bid to eliminate the Jews. Yet the reality remains that long before the Jews said yes, and the Arabs said no, the Jews also said no, the Ottomans said no, and the British and Americans also said no to the Zionist imperative. This is evidenced by historical documents and policies. It is very well known that the British attended the 6th World Zionist Congress in Berlin, which was conducted in 1903, long before the Zionists established themselves in Palestine. Joseph Chamberlain, who represented the British interests, presented the Ugandan scheme before the Zionist Congress in as early as 1903, proposing that they settled in Uganda, which was at the time under the British administration. 
Theodor Herzl and his Zionist cabinet said no to the proposal. As a matter of fact, seven years earlier, Theodor Herzl traveled to Istanbul for an audience with Sultan Abdul Hamid II in an attempt to bribe him with a fortune of over $11.6 billion in exchange for land in Palestine. This was at the time when Ottoman administration was under crippling debts and on the verge of economic ruin. So the financial incentive to accept the Zionist offer was certainly not inconsequential. However, Sultan Abdul Hamid said no to the proposal. But the Zionists could not take no for an answer and instead opted for a more incremental and subtle infiltration into the Holy Land by means of migration in lesser numbers. But the British also said no to this. In 1939, the British establishment published the White Papers. This policy paper provided many resolutions and conditions for the administration of Palestine while it was under British mandates. One of the clauses outlined was that the Jews could not migrate to the region in numbers greater than 75,000 for a period of five years. Nor could this be overturned or lifted once the five years had elapsed without the majority Arabs being consulted and agreeing to a relaxation of these terms. Furthermore, to ensure that the Zionists did not usurp the land and encroach upon the property and territory of the indigenous population, Britain prohibited the Jewish community from purchasing and acquiring more than 5% of the land owned by the Arabs. All of this is documented and evidenced. So in light of all of this, why wouldn't the Zionists say yes to a 50-50 split of the territory less than a decade later? And why on earth would the Palestinians not say no, considering the fact that the Zionists had an alternative proposal to settle elsewhere and that the British had literally gone back on the measures outlined in the White Papers of 1939? No, it would appear as if everyone said no to the Zionists until 1948. The Palestinians had every right to refuse the deal. Ethnic cleansing is a very powerful expression. If in 1948 there were around 700,000 Palestinians and today there are 7 million in the land of Israel, you can't really use this term. I have a question for you and all other Zionist sympathizers who seek to minimize the suffering of the Palestinians by using statistics. In Germany, was it 6 million or just 600,000? And while you figure out the answer to that riddle, let us point out to the very obvious contradiction when you later on admit that 700,000 Palestinians who resided in the region in 1948 were later removed from their land. Yes, during the War of Independence, many Arab villagers were destroyed and about 700,000 people were displaced. That's what happens when you try to wipe out your neighbors. You might well lose and have to pay the price. Thereby implying that within just a year, Israel had managed to displace and dispossess the entire Arab-Palestinian population from their homes. Yet you do not consider that ethnic cleansing. According to his final report, the Commission of the United Nations describes ethnic cleansing in the following terms. A purposeful policy designed by one ethnic or religious group to remove by violent and terror-inspiring means the civilian population of another ethnic or religious group from a certain geographic area. They go on to mention the different means by which this may be executed, including severe physical injury to civilians, confinement of civilian populations in ghetto areas, forcible removal, displacement of civilian populations, deliberate military attacks or threats of attacks on civilians and civilian areas, destruction of property, attacks on hospitals. All of these constitute crimes against humanity and can be assimilated to specific war crimes. 
Furthermore, such acts could also fall within the meaning of genocide convention. I would now like to draw the audience's attention to the growth in population and the disproportionate balance of power between Arabs and Israelis since 1948. The information on display was sourced and published by Israel's Central Bureau of Statistics in a paper published as recently as December 30th, 2021. The report discloses the following facts and figures, wherein the Jewish population currently constitutes 73.9% of the total population, while the Arabs only account for 21.1% and the remaining groups 5%. The Jewish community numbered approximately 806,000 in 1948 and have grown exponentially by a factor of 12 ever since. Even when we combine the Arab populations in Palestinian regions and those within the state of Israel, the Jewish community still remains a majority. It would seem as if the ethnic cleansing certainly took effect, even if the Zionists prefer to call it self-defense. Jews have always migrated, or as we say in Hebrew, gone up to the land of Israel. In the 17th and 18th centuries, Jews came from all over the Jewish world, from Europe, from North Africa, from Yemen, in small numbers due to the harsh conditions. It would be nice to get a definition of what the Jewish world is which geographical regions were encompassed by this imaginary realm, and when did it come into existence. As a matter of fact, the historical account is that there is no Jewish world. The global Jewish population prior to 1948 was in fact dispersed and divided along the lines of geographical, historical and ethnic lines. They do not share the same outlook on world history, nor have all Jews inherited the same traumatic experiences that continue to haunt the European Jews who now make up the vast majority of those who reside in the Zionist state of Israel. The Jewish world, if ever there was such a thing, includes three main categories of people. They are the Mizrahim, the Sephardic, and the Ashkenazi, who are often known as the Hasidic Jews. The first category are the Mizraim, also known as the Oriental Jews. These people originate primarily from Iraq, Persia, and Yemen, but can often be found in North Africa in regions such as Morocco. The Mizraim have never left the Middle East or North Africa and continue to inhabit the various regional enclaves and lands in and around Palestine as they have since the beginning of biblical times. They are by no means to be confounded or equated with the European Jewish community. This is a mistake that is far too often perpetuated by the masses and only serves to give European Jews an instrument of deception that many Zionists use to cloak and conceal their real identity and true origins, thereby claiming legitimacy and a right to the ancestral inheritance of the true Jews. The Mizraim Jewish community has had a long history and record in Muslim Arab society. They lived along Muslims for over 1400 years and share many customs and traditions with neighboring Arab tribes. The Habani Jews of Yemen, for example, are nearly indistinguishable from the Yemeni Muslims in their attire, language and customs. This close proximity to Arab Muslim society is further strengthened by the fact that Mizraim women are permitted to marry into Arab Muslim families and that this practice is possible and acceptable according to the guidelines in the Quran itself. Ironically, it was only after they were invited into the Zionist states in 1948 that the Mizraim Jews faced severe discrimination and marginalization, not from the Arabs, but from their European Hasidic Jewish counterparts, who looked down on the Middle Eastern Jews as inferior. The same treatment was directed towards the Ethiopian Jewish community, known as Beta Israel. These people also arrived in Israel in 1948 and continued to be mistreated and subjected to racial abuse by their European Jewish neighbors. We must now stress the fact that the experience and outlook of the indigenous Jews whose ancestral line has been unbroken and uninterrupted since biblical times is naturally very different to that of the European Jewish community whose history is fraught with violence and trauma which was inflicted upon them by their Christian neighbors in Poland, Ukraine, Russia, Britain, France, Italy, Spain and Portugal. A traumatic collective experience that the Jewish European community carries to this very day and wishes to superimpose upon others 
in order to pass it off as a Jewish global trauma induced by none other than the Arabs and Muslims. This of course is a false narrative and must be dismantled. The second category of Jews are the Sephardic Jews who lived alongside the Muslims in the Iberian Peninsula, this being Spain and Portugal, under the reign and protection of successive Muslim dynasties from the days of the Umayyads to the al murabitun and al muwahhidun as well as the Nasrids. This community sits in between a European experience and a Middle Eastern reality. Again, the outlook and experience of these Jews is very different to that of the European Hasidic Jewish counterparts. During the waves of persecution in medieval Europe, many Sephardic Jews found a refuge in Muslim lands as they were forced to convert to Catholicism or face expulsion from Spain after 1492. Sultan Bayezid II sent Kemal Reis to save the Sephardic Jews of Spain in 1492 by granting them permission to settle in the Ottoman Empire. Moses bin Maimun, also known as Maimonides or Rambam, was a Sephardic Jewish philosopher scholar who became one of the most prolific and influential Torah scholars of the Middle Ages. In his time he was also a preeminent astronomer and physician, serving as the chief personal physician of Sultan Salahuddin. He was born in Cordoba during the Almorabitun dynasty and became the head of the Jewish community in Egypt where he died and is now buried in Fostat. I find it absurd that people like my great grandmother who came to Israel from Eastern Europe in the 1920s after dreaming about the Jewish homeland for generations are seen as white colonialists. Now we come to the last and the most significant group those who spearheaded and championed the Zionist movement from its very inception and continue to do so today. These are the Ashkenazi Hasidic Jewish diaspora. We must stress the fact that about half of the Jewish population worldwide today identifies as Ashkenazi, meaning that they are descended from Jews who originate from Central or Eastern Europe. The term was initially used to define a distinct cultural group of Jews who settled in the 10th century in Rhineland in Western Germany. The Hasidic community is distinct from all other Jewish groups in their genetic and customary makeup. Studies have also shown and proven that they trace their ancestry and genetic bond to the Germanic and Eastern European bloc. Unlike Mizraim and Sephardic Jews or even the Ethiopian community, the Ashkenazi have experienced intolerable discrimination and persecution throughout the centuries preceding 1948. This culminated in Germany's extermination camps in the early 20th century. Naturally, this community of Jews has had a very different outlook on world history and they are far more impacted by the horrors and tragedies associated with being a Jew in the Western world. However, they have spun this narrative around by seeking to vilify and blame the Arabs and Muslims for all their suffering, identifying Arabs and Muslims as the chief perpetrators of these horrible crimes which is not historically accurate, nor ethically sound. What we are witnessing today in Palestine is a retribution of a European Jewry whose past traumatic experience in Europe has driven them to the limits of desperation and cruelty. Their cold-heartedness and resolve to destroy and demolish any perceived threat to their existence was caused not by the Arab Palestinians, nor by the Muslims of this world but by the very European nations who today stand as proud allies and supporters of the Zionist project. In short, the Hasidic Ashkenazi Jewish community is a victim of Stockholm Syndrome and they seek to cure it by punishing the Arabs. In Morocco in 1948, there were 265,000 Jews. Today there are around 2,000. In Iraq, there were 135,000 Jews in 1948. Today there are fewer than 10. Algeria used to be home to 140,000 Jews. Today there are fewer than 50, and I can go on. It is Muslim countries who perpetrated ethnic cleansing on the Jews. Now that we have dispelled and dismissed the monolithic myth of a global Judeo-cultural and historical experience, let us investigate a bit closely his claims of a Muslim Arab purge of Jewish populations, which resulted in their mass migration towards Jerusalem in 1948. The truth is that before Israel's declaration of independence in 1948, approximately 800,000 Jews were living in lands that are now considered the modern Arab world. A further 200,000 Jews lived in Pehlav, Iran and the Republic of Turkey. The sum total of all of these communities is estimated to be around a million. 
These were Jewish communities who were indigenous to the Middle East and North Africa. They were by no means newcomers, nor were they kicked out of their ancestral homes in Iran, Iraq, Syria, Yemen, Morocco and other places. What Zionists seek to do is to misinterpret the reality of what really happened from 1948 onwards. After independence, the Zionist establishment, headed by the first Israeli Prime Minister and the architect of the mass migration program, David Ben-Gurion, presented the Knesset with a plan to double the Jewish population within just four years. This meant bringing in 600,000 migrants in a four-year period, or 150,000 per year, absorbing 150,000 newcomers annually under the trying conditions facing the new state was a heavy burden indeed. The first large-scale exodus took place in the late 1940s and in the early 1950s. Jews came from Iran, Iraq, Yemen and Libya. In these cases, over 90% of the Jewish population left the countries, heading towards Israel. In fact, very few Jews from Muslim nations and Arab nations left their country during the British Mandate period. Around 900,000 Jews from Muslim-majority nations in West Asia, North Africa, and to a lesser extent Central Asia, Southern Asia, and Southwest Asia in the 20th century, packed up and left their countries in response to the creation of Israel and the invitation of the Prime Minister of Israel. Up to 600,000 Jews from the Arab and neighboring regions reached Israel by 1972. According to researchers and scholars, there are two major factors for the Zionist mass immigration movements of the 1940s. The first was initiated in 1944 by Ben Goron when he called for bringing in a million Jews to Palestine, even if public soup kitchens had to be set up to feed them. The second drive was to extend the call for migration to include the indigenous Jews who were already living amongst the Arabs and the Muslims in surrounding nations. Opponents in the Jewish Agency and the Government of Mass Immigration argued that there was no justification for organizing large-scale immigrations among Jews whose lives were not in danger, particularly when the desire and motivation were not their own. The historical record speaks for itself. These were not Jews who were being expelled from the Arab lands. They were ideologically and economically incentivized to leave and travel to Jerusalem on the orders and command of the Jewish Prime Minister, David ben Garon, whose objective was to bolster up the Jewish population in four years. 800,000 Jews were brutally expelled from Muslim countries. For some reason, no one cares about them or wants to tell their story. Millions of articles and papers have been written about the Palestinians who had to evacuate their homes because of a war they started. Yet very little has been written about the Jews living in Muslim countries who were subjected to pogroms and had to flee, even though they were innocent. Now that we've dispelled another myth concerning the so-called expulsion of Jews from the Muslim lands, we come to the issue of pogroms and persecution. It is rather ironic that he claims that it was the Arabs who subjected the Jewish populations to pogroms in their lands. The Arabs being blamed for pogroms even though they cannot pronounce the letter P is as asinine as it gets. But that is beside the point. In actuality, pogroms were widespread in Europe and Russia. The term itself originated from the Russian language and entered the English lexicon later on. It describes a mass purge of Jewish people, particularly in the European Christian world. Throughout the 19th and 20th century, new types of anti-Semitism developed across Europe. In the Russian Empire, many waves of violent and deadly riots targeting Jews were recorded, as were others across the European realms. The Odessa pogroms, lasting between 1821 to 1905 in Ukraine, were examples of this. Others included the Warsaw pogrom in 1881, the Kishinev pogrom in Moldova in 1903, the Kiev pogrom in Ukraine in 1905, the Bialystok pogrom in Poland in 1906, the Lwów pogrom in Ukraine in 1918, the Kiev pogrom again in 1919, and the Kristallnacht pogrom, the Night of the Broken Glass in Germany, on November 9th, 1938. This toxic and vitriolic European vice and sentiment towards the Jewish community, whom they refer to as Christ killers, 
prevailed long before the Holocaust. The 800,000 Jews who were so-called expelled and subject to pogroms in the Muslim world were in fact nothing less than economic and ideological migrants who were invited to Jerusalem. However, the Jews coming from Europe were the victims of these pogroms. And this is something he doesn't talk about in his video. It is well known that governments and churches across Europe imposed waves of restrictions on Jews, dictating where they could and couldn't live, which jobs and professions they could hold, even banning them from owning land and property, and at times forcing them to wear distinctive markings to make them social pariahs. In this period, European literature and media were saturated with anti-Semitic propaganda and conspiracy theories about Jewish families and their economic control over the financial world. The protocols of the elders of Zion being the most popular amongst these anti-Jewish conspiracies was first published in Russia in 1903. The fictitious document was popularized outside Russia following the revolution in 1917 and spread rapidly towards continental Europe where the Polish and German ideologues internalized the fear and hatred of Jews, culminating in the horrific events in the years to follow. These conspiracies, pogroms and vilification campaigns were not present in the Muslim Arab world at all. As a matter of fact, the Zionist movement was founded as a direct response to European anti-Semitism in the 19th century, long before the Holocaust. In actuality, many Jews were desperate to leave Europe and they channeled their hopes and ambitions towards establishing a new home in the Middle East. In conclusion, we have addressed, responded to and debunked the misinformation and gross falsification of history when it comes to Palestine and Palestinians vis-à-vis -vis the Zionist State of Israel and its constituents from ancient times through to 1948 and beyond. We have also provided extensive citations and references for all the points raised in this presentation. A downloadable copy of this resource is accessible to those wishing to get a copy of the information provided herein. A link to where this material can be downloaded will be provided in the comments and description box below. In parting, I would like to extend an open invitation towards the channel that published the original video or to any other Zionist whose counterclaim against the Palestinian people's rights to exist in their ancestral land is based solely on historical accounts. You are most welcome to sit on a panel of Muslim historians who will engage you in a fair and open discussion and exchange of historical accounts. If you feel that anything mentioned or covered in this presentation is false, inaccurate or ahistorical. Finally, to the brothers and sisters in Palestine and to anyone else who supports the Palestinians, history is on our side.